Oopsies. I forgot um, about the timer, so the 20 minute mark. So I'm going to go back really quick and kind of try to um, jump back into where I was reading the introduction of Ayn Rand's Virtue of Selfishness, this amazing greatness here. Um, so we're just on that sentence where we're talking about that it's an intrinsic right for man. And just to clarify also, um, whenever these uh, these books are written in the times past, you know, we still use man as a representative of mankind, humanity. Of course, it's not gender specific. It's not just the right of men to live um, the objectivist lifestyle. She's not speaking about men exclusively. It encompasses men, women, and, you know, children, all, all beings. And that sentence again, it is the right of man, mankind, to do so, derived from nature as man, as a being of humanity, and from the function of moral values in human life, and therefore is applicable only in the context of a rational, objectively demonstrated, and validated code of moral principles, which divine define and determine his actual self-interest. It is not a license to do as he pleases, and it is not applicable to the altruist image of a selfish brute, nor to any man motivated by irrational emotions, feelings, urges, wishes, or whims. This is said as a warning against the kind of Nietzschean egoists, who in fact are a product of the altruist morality and represent the other side of the altruist coin. The men who believe that any action, regardless of its nature, is good if it is intended for one's own benefit. Just as the satisfaction of the irrational desires of others is not a criterion of moral value, neither is the satisfaction of one's own irrational desires. So here's where she shuts down the idea that selfishness, um, as she means it, means that anything goes, just like I was talking about in the previous video with the whole um, concept of, um, with religious sects where it's just like Satanism, where you believe that you can do what you will and that it's okay. They create, they, they think that they create lanes where they can um, infringe on others, where they can um, put people under these sort of spells that we are in society where we kind of um, allow things to, to, to just slip right past us as if it's acceptable, the things that are very wrong and we just don't speak against them because they fall under, there, there's no law against them, right? So there's, there's this gray area where you can have a system, even in certain religions, not to offend anyone, please, please don't take offense, but where, where it's just these package deals to where, um, you know, a certain society would believe that a man should, you know, is here to spread his seed and therefore he should not be tied down to a single woman so he can um, have multiple wives and whatnot. And so this, this idea appeals to a certain character, right, a certain mindset that says, yes, that's what I'm here for. But then um, the package deal doesn't really serve the objectivist who, who tries to take these concepts back and balances out all aspects. You, you look at the metaphysical components of everything. Why do we do a certain thing? What is the point of sex? What is the point of procreation? What are we doing to prolong this existence? If, if the point of man is to spread his seed, then what is it that he is growing? So you're growing and you're having children and you're birthing these beings into a world, but if you're not based, if you're not in a world that is based on morality and a certain code of ethics, then you're just perpetuating the existence that is going to serve what? Serve what purpose? More debauchery, more um, self-serving, more um, separateness, more um, of these fleeting um, living by whims and not by um, codes and values and morals. So you see that these things kind of fall apart when you actually put them under the lens of an actual scope or frame of reference. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we believe the things that we believe? Why do we shy away from 
making ourselves the leading um, character in our lives? Why is it wrong to want to better myself? Why do I have to carry another who um, abdicates their um, kingship to do the same? Um, continuing on, morality is not a consent, sorry, a contest of whims, just as we were talking about. Morality is not a contest of whims. See Mr. Brandon's articles, Counterfeit Individualism, and Isn't Everyone Selfish, which follow. A similar type of error is committed by the man who declares that since man must be guided by his own independent judgment, any action he chooses to take is moral if he chooses it. So we're continuing down this path. One's own independent judgment is the means by which one must choose one's actions. But it is not a moral criterion, nor a moral validation. Only reference to a demonstrable principle can validate one's choices. Just as man cannot survive by any random means, but must discover and practice the principles which his survival requires, so man's self-interest cannot be determined by blind desires or random whims, but must be discovered and achieved by the guidance of rational principles. This is why the objectivist ethics is a morality of rational self-interest or of rational selfishness. Since selfishness is concern with one's own interests, the objectivist ethics uses that concept in its exact and purest sense. Because we're pure here. We don't infringe on others. We don't manipulate others. We don't um, seek to gain from others without giving them something equal in return. We don't compete with others because what is for us will always be for us. And we, we know that we have a divine birthright, gifts that are coming to us um, where we're free to choose and move through this existence. We so also have a specific place within this realm and a mission to serve and, and, and a place to stand. And so that's why we don't need to take from anybody else. We don't want what, any, what belongs to anybody else. So we gotta take those moments to check in with our moral compass and see what comes from within that vast, infinite inner consciousness, that knowing that pervades and permeates all things. And we ask, is this for me? Is this mine? And if it's not, please just guide me towards what is mine because I don't seek to take from another. And that's where rational selfishness comes in. I want every bit of what is mine best believe, and I'm going to have it, but I'm not going to be so stupid and naive to say that I should have every bit of everything just because it exists. Because that whole YOLO idea that you only live once, that's not quite right here because we know that we lived many, many times before and there was enough time to live that and experience this and do that, but this time, this time is unique. This time is for you, and this time um, you'll live the most full life if you have all that which is um, set up for you to have. And you do that by following a code of ethics, by living morally and having rational self-interest because it's the only way that you're not gonna deplete yourself by serving others who are not living based on morals and ethics. And you see that in the way that their lives are unfolding. Since selfishness, I just read this part, oh, but I'll read this again, because it's worth reiterating. Since selfishness is concerned with one's own interests, the objectivist ethics uses that concept in its exact and purest sense. It is not a concept that one can surrender to man's enemies, nor to the unthinking misconceptions, distortions, prejudices, and fears of the ignorant and the irrational. The attack on selfishness is an attack on man's self-esteem. To surrender one is to surrender the other. So to surrender selfishness is to surrender your self-esteem. If I, if I, if I want to value myself and what I believe that I add to the equation, um, I have to matter, right? If you say that a person shouldn't matter and that everyone else matters first, then you're saying that there's no reason to have any pride or anything to strive for individually because it's all got to be collective. But 
inspirational selfishness, I would use this to go back into unity consciousness because once I better myself, I better serve everyone else. By being present in my fullness, I can be a better member of the larger group and body that I'm a part of. Now a word about the material in this book. With the exception of the lecture on ethics, it is a collection of, of essays that appeared in the Objectivist Newsletter, a monthly journal of ideas edited and published by Nathaniel Brandon and myself, Ayn Rand. The newsletter deals with the application of the philosophy of objectivism to the issues and problems of today's culture, more specifically, with that intermediary level of intellectual concern which lies between philosoph philosophical abstractions and the journalistic concretes of day-by-day -day existence. Its purpose is to provide its readers with a consistent philosoph philosophical... I'm getting a little tongue-tied. It's time to wrap it up. Let's go back and slow it down. The newsletter deals with the application of the philosophy of objectivism to the issues and problems of today's culture, more specifically, with that intermediary level of intellectual concern which lies between philosophical abstractions and the journalistic concretes of day-by-day -day existence. Its purpose is to provide its readers with a consistent philosophical frame of reference. This collection is not a systematic discussion of ethics, but a series of essays on those ethical subjects which need clarification in today's context or which had been most confused by altruism's influence. You may observe that the titles of some of the essays are in the form of a question. These come from our intellectual ammunition department that answers questions sent in by our readers. The subhead of that department states, as many questions as space permits will be answered, no questions will be answered by mail. I should like to address the same request to the readers of this book. It is impossible for me to engage in philosophical correspondence. If you have any questions to ask me, please address them to the Intellectual and Ammunition Department, the Objectivist Newsletter, it gives the address and um, information on how to contact Ayn Rand, of course, when she was still with us. It says, I shall be glad to hear from you since questions have always interested me. Questions, not debates, I have given those up long ago. And this was written by Ayn Rand in New York in September of 1964. And that closing was another great point. She gave up debates. She refused to debate with people because um, her, she was just so dope. So like, why would I debate with someone? Because if they disagree with me, their, base, their, their mind is based on a philosophical foundation that doesn't agree with me. It's like, we don't, we don't operate the same way mentally. We don't have the same morals and codes of ethics. So to debate, to debate is basically um, a waste of time. And, it, and that read rub people the wrong way too, because it's like, so then you only circulate or you only associate with people who agree with you. And she basically kind of say, yeah. And in the beginning I saw, I thought, wow, that's kind of like, a kind of maybe that's from her Soviet Russian background or that's that kind of dictator lifestyle. It's like what I say goes and I'm right and there's no room for any influence, but that's not true because she would, dialogue with her people, people that she knew had um, the same fundamental values that believe that man's right is, man's life is supreme and um, the mind is a magical powerful tool and we need to explore it and, and reward thinkers and, and contributors and people who want to create, whether that's art or architecture or film or um, politics or, you know, any kind of thing that val that Maybe not politics, because she felt like government should be like this big, or gone. Business, and industry, and things that serve to run the machine of life. And then um, people that want to be like, well, hey, I'm small, and I, and I need help from everybody else, and what about me? You know, you're wrong to say. She was just like, "That's you need to just start from the basics, basically, because you're a powerful being, and you're just acting from this this mindset of smallness that isn't really going to be ready to receive what I'm all about. So study, work on it, and we can talk later. 
So I think that's kind of another interesting thing about Ayn Rand. So I hope, again, the virtue of selfishness, I hope this was interesting, useful, or insightful to you. If you want to look more into Ayn Rand, again, um, her website, AynRand.org, there's a great, and you can listen to her talks, lectures, her voice with very thick accent, but maybe if I read some of these essays, you know, down the line, we can, we can dialogue on it more. All right, thanks for watching. Take care.